This talk is about uh, a model for development of curricula. It doesn't necessarily have to be curricula in electrical engineering. It doesn't have to be CDIO curricula. The model has been formulated in a very general way and, we, and uh, we've actually been using it for other kinds of curriculum development as well. But uh, in this context, in this conference, I'll, I'll focus on uh, CDIO uh, curriculum in electrical engineering. And uh, my co-author, Klaus Kergo, is actually head of the program development in electrical engineering, the Bachelor of Engineering program at this university. Now, we heard in the previous lecture that uh, curriculum development is a change process. Uh, it has to do with uh, changes. How do you implement changes? And actually, the starting point for, for the model that I'm presenting is a model for organizational change, which is fairly well known in, uh, in organizational theory. It was developed by Leavitt back in the 60s. And uh, the idea of that model is that you've got a number of different influences or components which uh, together describe the most important influences, at least, uh, of, an, of the change in an organization, if you want to change the organization. And uh, these influences, they are given here, technology, task, structure, and people. Uh, the technology that the organization works with, uh, the tasks that the organization should fulfill, the structure of the organization and the people in the organization. They are the main components. Now, in later, this, this is the original from 65. In later versions of uh, this model, there's also a change leader in the middle. Uh, in, in, in the center of this figure, you can, fi you can find in later versions a change leader. And the basic message is that you cannot change just one of the components in the model without having a look at the other ones. Uh, either you can have a, a look at the other ones deliberately, or changes will happen uh, in a way which you don't control if you don't really consider what is going on. Now, modifying that model to uh, curriculum design, uh, we ended up with a model like this one here. Uh, again, four components. and. I've set curriculum design in the middle. Maybe I should set curriculum designer because that's really uh, the change leader in the middle. He or she should take care of uh, these four influences components that uh, I'm describing in, in the four ellipses. Uh, in engineering curriculum development, there's the engineering science. If it was a curriculum in social sciences, it would be a different kind of science that you had there. But there'll be the scientific developments in one end, the business environment, that is uh, the job market, you could say. That is what are we uh, trying to educate our engineers for. Uh, and then there's uh, the university environment. This is uh, parallel to, to uh, the structure in Leavitt's model. What, is, uh, what kind of university do we have? What are the policies of the university and so forth? And then, of course, there are the people. And the people, in our case, that's the teachers and the students. So this is basically the model, and the main message is that you cannot change in just one of these ellipses without having a look at what happens in the other ones. Uh, something will happen. If you uh, introduce new teachers, it will have an influ influence on uh, what uh, will be done in engineering science. It may have an influence on uh, how the university operates, it will have, may have an influence on your interactions with uh, the business environment. So that is a basic message. Now, here are some details of the model. I put in a few words, extra additional words in each of the ellipses, and I'm sure you cannot see them, at least not if, if, if you are not seated in one of the first rows. So I'll go on by explaining a little bit of what these words that you cannot see, what is really hidden behind them. And I'll start with the engineering science, and I'm talking electrical engineering. And, uh, whoops, in hmm, electrical engineering, uh, or electronics engineering, there's one very famous 
model which sort of predicts uh, the technology development, and that's Moore's, Mo Moore's law. And basically, Moore's law say, uh, tells you that the dimensions in an integrated circuit decreases, halves, uh, roughly every one and a half year. And this means that you can make systems of higher complexity. As time goes by, you can make systems of increasing complexity. Now, uh, this model has been used in order to make roadmaps for developments in electronics, and this is uh, the standard roadmap by the uh, semiconductor industry, uh, used by the semiconductor industry. Uh, it identifies three different areas of development. There's something called uh, more and more, which is just a continuous development of uh, decreasing dimensions, enabling you to, to make more complex systems. That's mostly important for uh, computer science people, uh, because then they can make bigger computers. Uh, then there's the beyond CMOS. Well, f for those of you who are, who are in electronics, you would know that CMOS cannot be scaled beyond a few nanometers of of dimensions, and right now we're in the 15 nanometers range. So there's a limit to how much uh, we can go in scaling, and then we'd have to develop new technologies. This is mostly for the physicists. And then there's an area called more than more, where we take traditional electronics and combine with MEMS, that is microelectromechanical systems, uh, radio frequency systems, high voltage, and sensors and stuff like that. That is where the typical classical uh, electrical engineer comes in, or electronics engineer really comes in. This was, uh, this was the engineering science, very br briefly. Here's the business uh, environment. Um, in a global view, one uh, important issue is how do you split the markets between different kinds of, of products or services and uh, the message here is ma mainly that services, that's becoming the most important thing, also for the electronics engineers, whereas the traditional electronics development is much less in terms of annual turnover. And uh, if you go to the semiconductor manufacturing of integrated circuits, then it's even less and material and equipment is even less. Going back 50 years, you would have seen the engineer, electrical engineer, very much in this field. But, but that's not the case any longer. It's services. You know that from the mobile phone. You can have the same platform of a mobile phone. The functionality depends on which services you put on the mobile phone. Now, in a national perspective, when considering what is the Danish business environment, well, uh, in electronics, uh, the, the Danish business environment is characterized by a few things which we don't have. We don't have any really large companies, and we don't have companies in the mass consumer market. Fifty years ago, we, we used to have a lot of companies in TV manufacturing, for instance, radio manufacturing. There's one left, and that's Bang & Olufsen, and that's not mass consumer. Uh, it's too, too costly to be a mass consumer product. Um, uh, we have absolutely no companies in semiconductors, at least not in high-volume se semiconductor manufacturing. And in fact, uh, that goes for very many countries. Uh, the semiconductor manufacturing is being concentrated in the f mostly in the Far East, moving out of Europe, basically. Uh, now, what we do have is that we've got small and medium-sized ent uh, enterprises in professional markets and for original equipment manufacturers. So uh, it's business to business, uh, which is uh, the main segment there. And we've got niche project uh, products. Uh, we've got some companies uh, which are very strong in their specific niche. One niche uh, which is famous in Denmark, that's hearing aids. Uh, three of the major hearing aid manufacturers in, in the world, they're based in Denmark and have more than 50% of the world market uh, share in hearing aids. Now, we've got a lot of startup companies in electronics, small startup companies in, for instance, uh, digital amplifiers and uh, energy systems of different kind. 
And this leads to another th few things that we do have. We have a large and innovative energy sector and a large and innovative health sector. So these are the kind of, of fields that we should focus on when, when uh, uh, making uh, engineering curricula. Now for the, hmm, I'm too far away perhaps. For the university environment, there's a global perspective. Uh, universities tend to follow, at least in Europe, the Bologna model with uh, bachelor programs, master programs, and PhD programs. And uh, we can see a number of strategic alliances between universities. We see a specialization. Some universities become elite universities with the PhD programs and that kind of stuff. Others find their, s their strengths uh, like uh, university colleges. And then we see educational networks uh, between different universities and between universities and industry. Uh, and we see programs, even programs, full programs, shared between universities. Uh, in a BTU perspective, uh, we have some constraints from, from the university environment when developing curricula. We have a strategy of the university and educational policy of the university. This is, for instance, uh, the policy that defines that for our Bachelor of Engineering programs. We use CDIO for training our teachers. We've got a learning lab. Uh, where all uh, new teachers have to go through an educational process in order to learn how to teach. And uh, then we've got programs uh, headed by, by directors of studies, and the programs cross several departments, but we've got study boards which are department-related. Uh, so there are some things there which... Uh, are constraints when developing a curriculum. One of the more severe constraints is perhaps that we've got a fixed semester structure and a fixed modular course schedule, and we've had that for, well, about close to 40 years by now. It started when I was a student. I think it was in 72 it, we started that, uh, that scheme. Oops. Um, our teachers and our students only in a DTU perspective here. We have ma a maximum number of students per program. We know where we get the students from. Uh, we know that in our bachelor programs, we've got Danish students, and in our master programs, PhD programs, we've got international students. These are things to consider when developing the curriculum. Uh, the fact that we've got Danish students in the bachelor programs also means that the bachelor programs are taught in Danish, and that, of course, creates some challenges if you want to uh, make uh, international networks in the bachelor programs. So they are mostly in our master programs, which are by, defini uh, by definition not necessarily CDIO-based. The teachers uh, in both bachelor programs and master programs, they're mostly faculty staff, and they're also involved in research. So they have strong research interests, and their research interests are reflected in the curriculum. There's no way you can avoid that, except uh, changing the teachers. I mean, you can, you can hire new teachers with other research interests, and that's, <laughs> yeah, I know I'm four minutes, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, here is a program which is going to, the curriculum which is going to be presented in another talk, so I won't spend time on that now. Uh, but this is the final result of the development process. So uh, I, I just briefly mentioned that in the program, the CDIO characteristics, they're taking care of the technical knowledge uh, is very much being defined through a model like the one that I've shown. And then these other characteristics like the personal and professional skills, the interpersonal skills, and the conceiving and engineering skills, they're actually taken care of by the university environment to a large degree because the university has issued a handbook for CDIO in our Bachelor of Engineering programs. And that handbook 
which is about 30 pages, gives you all the guidelines for how to implement these CDIO objectives in the Bachelor of Engineering programs. So conclusions and recommendations. Well, the main thing is that we've got these four influences, the engineering science, the business environment, the university environment, and the teachers and the students. And they're the, uh, they're the influences, the components that you should consider in developing a curriculum. Uh, some of them are automatically handled uh, by the CDIO syllabus. Uh, you have... Uh, uh, you have in the CDIO syllabus, uh, you have automatically included industrial representatives, teachers and students and alumni uh, in the development of, uh, of the uh, curriculum. And in DTU, uh, we have the CDIO handbook telling us to a large extent how to handle the specific CDIO issues in the curriculum development. And our Bachelor of Engineering program has been developed with due consideration of these components. So this is basically the message. But the model can be used for also non-CDIO curriculum development. So thank you. <laughs>